Good afternoon and welcome to CIPR TV on Thursday the 8th of December with me, Philip Sheldrake. Today we have a specially extended show. Coming up shortly, we have a discussion on broadcast media. And then in around 20 minutes time, we'll have Dr. John White with us discussing this week's report, PR 2020, the future of public relations. I'll apologize now for those of you expecting to see CIPR CEO Jane Wilson with us today. Unavoidably, she can't make it. For the first, first part of the show, we're joined in the studio by Howard Kosky, Chairman of Marketeers for DC. Howard is here with us today to discuss the broadcast relating skills that PR professionals need and the opportunities and challenges of broadcast in 2012. And don't forget, if you have a question you'd like to put to any of our guests this evening, then please do so on the form on the screen. Or, of course, always you can tweet with the hashtag hash CIPRTV and we'll do our best to in integrate those questions into the show. Howard, thanks very much for joining us today. Pleasure, Phil. Good a, to see you. A, a broadcast public relations stalwart, aren't you? I've been doing it for a few years. 1994, so, I believe. 1994 was when the business was established, so uh, almost 18 years. Uh, lots changed. Uh, yeah, to tell me about that. Lost what, my what, hair, obviously, what, over the years. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> what else has changed apart from your hair loss? Um, broadcast landscape has changed dramatically. I mean, it, when I sort of reflect on 1994, Commercial radio, 50, 60 stations. Uh, one of the biggest groups in radio then was Transworld. There was no sight of a brand called Heart, or Global Radio didn't exist. The BBC was, local BBC was Alan Partridge esque radio, and right. there's a lot of that still. Five Live Four is there, no digital channels. It's amazing because it's not that long ago, is it? It's only the 90s, which to you and me is <laughs> a prime of our life. <laughs> We're still in the prime of our life, Phil. Um, but that has changed dramatically, and, and it was ra radio in particular was very much a co almost like a hobbyist. It was like a cottage industry, there for the taking, as it were. TV was being run as a business, but but radio didn't really have a business feel to it. Um, so the opportunities for PR, um, because it was very embryonic then, you could help shape, mould, you know, you could influence an awful lot more. Whereas now. Commercial radio is run by PLC groups, mm -hmm. looking at a P&L, very much heavy music influence. Local BBC, the BBC has very strict guidelines, but has great opportunities for good, informative editorial speech. Um, TV, TV's changed dramatically. If you look at local TV today, huge drop in the resource in local TV, which means it's a great opportunity for brands to do a lot of the legwork, um, because the money's not in local TV that they used to be. Um, obviously, but it's interesting because the figures for TV were supposed to be dropping off the edge of a cliff by now. If you look at some of the forecasts from the mid part of last decade, it was all going to be social media. It was always going to be on demand, um, time shifting, place shifting, you name it. And it, actually, TV viewership is, is, is going up. Maybe that's just a sign of the times and people want to save money and stay in and watch more of the box. <laughs> I think it's a combination of factors. The, the population still have a love of TV. Uh, they have a love of radio. The, the difference is the traditional platforms that you consume that on have changed. So it's not foreign to us to watch BBC programming via iPlayer on demand. You know, it's not, you know, we can download a podcast on iTunes of a BBC or a commercial radio program. So I think our love of broadcast is still there. I think the, the standards of programming are excellent in the UK. You know, if you go to North America and watch TV or listen to the radio there, you come back here almost with the joy of how fantastic <laughs> it is to be able to watch a program without, you know, every 30 seconds another ad break. So I think the quality of programs there, drama certainly is fantastic, but also news. Over the last few years, we've seen rolling news channels. You know, I think we news junkies, you know, people want to be kept up to date. News has become a bit entertaining as well. You know, Sky News monsters its stories. So there is a love of TV, there is a love of radio. What social media has done has meant, you know, it's a platform from which we can consume it. You know, people are watching videos online with social media. You, know, you, can, listen, you can listen to audio online, social media, in social media environments. So what social media has done is just create new platforms of delivery mechanisms for us to be able to consume well, the content. I had the opportunity to chat to a senior figure at CNN while I was in the US last month. He made an interesting observation to say that rather than making the news, they now find the news. I mean, we've all seen the news these days where the, the, the first clip on the scene has been taken by someone's My smartphone. Device, yeah. That's an incredible, an incredible change. And what, I wonder whether you think the 
UK public relations practitioner is on the front foot in adapting to this new reality or is on the back foot? Uh, it'd be too easy to generalise and say yes or no to either. I think the reality is within the industry, I think the UK have become fairly early adopters compared to some other markets mm. on how to use social media from a broadcast perspective. You know, delivering, you know, like this program, Web TV, this, this is not standard in every nation around the world. Obviously, huge broadband penetration in the UK has certainly helped. But I think from a PR perspective, PRs have suddenly seen an opportunity with social media. They still like broadcast, you know, broadcast still has that weight, it still has an element of trophy coverage. You know, you get something on TV, it's still, I've been on TV. Yeah. Yeah. But I think PR world, the PR world's realised that whereas traditionally success and failure was perhaps not down to your capability, but whether a journalist got your story, didn't get your story, you can now access the end community, your end audience yourself, and you become the broadcaster. I thought it was fascinating, you know, interesting last week with Thomas Cook. Obviously, all before, you know, a lot of financial troubles. A lot of uh, speculation, was it going to go bust? You know, yeah, they delayed yeah. an announcement in the morning. The interim CEO did an interview with Sky, did an interview with the BBC, but also did an interview that he did himself that the brand, Thomas Cook, posted onto YouTube. I think that's very clever because if you do an interview with a broadcaster, you're not in control of knowing how that's going to look as an edited piece. Mm -hmm. You know, are they going to yeah, allow yeah. you to put your position across correctly? So I suppose the backstop then is, well, Okay, well, we'll serve our interview through traditional broadcast, but in addition, we'll also make sure we're in control of our message in full by becoming the broadcaster ourselves and the content creator. Well, actually, it sounds almost like broadcast is a bit of a misnomer now, because a broadcast kind of implies, uh, I'm the broadcaster, it's going out, six o'clock, Friday evening, watch it or miss it. Whereas actually you're talking about this, this capability to actually insert your own programming, to yes. actually give the niche audience, it's not necessarily about numbers is it, it's quality not quantity, giving the niche audience that you need to reach the content that you want to put out there to start the conversation. Yeah, I mean if, if you look at you know, YouTube, the headline YouTube, broadcast yourself. Now the phenomena when it first started was you'd watch a 30 second clip of some lunatic in Chicago do something crazy. There is as much opportunity for brand to broadcast itself and present its own programming content as there is through traditional, you know, yeah. approaching yeah. traditional broadcasting. So who's, who's doing it well, in your, in your opinion? Who's doing it well? Yeah, um, who's grasped this, the, the full power of, of this, this capability that we're now describing? Yeah, perhaps brands slightly less obvious to most. Uh, I, I think Saga are doing it quite well. Um, you know, Ros Altman as a spokesperson, you know, I watch Sky News every day and every few days Ros is there talking about something, representing the kind of the citizen, you know, the older citizens of the, of the population. But as well as using traditional broadcast, they do an awful lot of web TV programming. I've noticed they, they use web TV to talk to their members. They use it as a CRM mechanism. So I think as a publisher, you know, they Saga magazine as a publisher, they, they've realised that actually what broadcast can do is bring inflection in voice, it can bring body language, the whites of the eyes, which is easier to do in broadcast than it is in text, in print. Well, Ofcom doesn't regulate the web. You've suddenly got the ability to, be, to broadcast yourself. So someone like Saga, whilst to the layperson you may not notice it, that's good because at different touch points for you as a potential audience, and I'm not yet quite a Saga member, old enough to be a Saga member, not far off, but the fact of the matter is to, to their audience, they're interacting via traditional telly, mm -hmm. traditional radio, and then through yeah. a lot of you know, web TV and online video content. On that traditional side of things, the broadcast as we knew it, as we know it today, as in the broadcasters, yes. where's that going in the next two or three years? Um, Content is king. Content is absolutely king. Um, I think it'll be interesting because the traditional broadcasters, you know, I do I buy into the Sky brand? Now, Al Jazeera has just bought Premier League rights in a number of different countries. You would never have thought of Al Jazeera as being a major broadcaster of mm. the Premier yeah, League yeah. globally. I think money will talk. I think what you'll see in radio is, you know, global radio owns the vast majority of the commercial radio network. I think in TV land, through traditional telly, because of the cost to produce traditional telly, 
there is a barrier to many new people coming into the market. But I think as more and more people, you know, this Christmas, smart TVs, they believe will outsell traditional TVs. That will be phenomenal because the future will then be for broadcast, I'll go home of an evening, put on my TV. And watch CIPR TV. I can watch CIPR TV. <laughs> but I'd as easily be able to watch content via YouTube, which is the fourth largest search engine now, or a traditional broadcaster. So just by selecting my AV input on my remote, all of a sudden, instead of having access to a uh, you know, hundred odd channels, whatever it is, on you know, through Sky, I'll be able to access thousands of, of channels and programs through my broadband connection, through the same TV that is the TV. So you mentioned smart TV there. Yes. Uh, and obviously we've got digital radio. I'm just yes. thinking about the next steps coming up. We've got HD. Uh, 3D isn't doing too well in the home at the moment. And then I think the Olympics, we're going to try and put some quad HD or quad quad HD or, or something, massive screens with high resolution yeah. out there. Oh, the BBC are going to try and yeah. make that happen. Do you, do, are you excited about that? Not particularly. Not particularly, um, OK. I'm not that excited about, you know, HD, there is most definitely a difference in the quality when you switch back to a, a traditional view. Isn't it? But what excites me is the, the TV as a unit in the household being a platform from which I can consume broadcast content. So it's the fact that instead of having to have a laptop, the TV on in the background, a laptop to access the web, that one, that one big screen on the wall through my, my remote, I can access everything. That's the bit that I think is exciting because certainly from a PR perspective, if you're, if you're a brand and you're creating your own content, then through all the traditional PR routes, you can promote for people to watch your content. Yeah, yeah, In the yeah. same, you know, you, if you watch Jonathan Ross or any of the other programs, all the guests on there are promoting something. There is the, that's the PR world in motion you know you watch the news listen to it the PR world feeds a lot of that information but you're still reliant on the broadcaster taking the edit yeah, that you yeah, want yeah. now you as the brand will be able to sit alongside the broadcaster's content on the same screen on the same platform you won't have to switch so uh, in fact we have Dr John White coming up in, in a moment talking about public relations in 2020 a bit of uh, future gazing and I think we might still it, be working. <laughs> and uh, actually, alongside that, of course, we have the initiative that the Public Relations Society of America, the PRSA, has started recently, trying to question or review the very definition of public relations. But one of the themes that keeps coming through is this idea that we should be helping to affect mutual understanding between an organisation and and all its stakeholders. In other words, this kind of content should be the start of a conversation of an exchange of ideas so on that basis how much of the stuff that you do in this very studio is is, is live and interactive 85 90 percent of it's live okay, li li trans live live tv is so much more powerful than pre-recorded uh, because we see you know you see, we see a lot of guests a lot of spokespeople when they know it's pre-recorded they they overthink sometimes as to trying to create the perfect answer, the perfect response. They're looking at the perfect edit. We're actually, we're human beings. And you know, if, you, if as a brand you're putting up a spokesperson, they should know their subject. And, and it's, it's not about putting yourself into a contentious environment where suddenly you can start asking very awkward questions, but if you're, if, if you're passionate about something mm -hmm. and, and you, your human characteristics will actually provide an added layer of enthusiasm and belief in, in the story you're telling. And yeah, there are millions and millions of pre-recorded videos being uploaded to Lights YouTube every single day. They don't get standout. Live telly is what's interacting, it's what's engaging, it's real. Um, and I always try and encourage brands, you know, if, if you're passionate about something, you know your subject, do it live because it's a much better experience. Adrenaline kicks in. Yeah, yeah, you you yeah, can't yeah. factor for adrenaline in, in performance. In the sporting world they do. You, know, you look at a lot of sport, theatre, adrenaline is a key legal drug. It's the emotion, you know, isn't it, that it helps is. you get your point over. Your, Absolutely. So apart from do it live, do it real time, if you're a, a UK brand manager, a head of comms, head of marketing, what kind of New Year's resolutions would you be getting together for 2012 right now? I think, I think the vision I would suggest is that every brand will become a broadcaster at some point. But I think in the interim period, 
I think it's key for brands to understand the broadcast diet of the end audience. So rather than ex expect the end audience just to consume broadcast through traditional telly, traditional radio, to understand how within digital social media platforms, that end audience yeah. thereafter is also consuming content. And then look at the media owner, look at the platform, understand more about that platform, about that channel, and then create a strategy that fits all aspects, rather than trying to force a square peg into a round hole. It's about you know, segmenting the audience, looking at its broadcast media diet, and then creating a strategy that aligns to those access points for that, for that end audience. You love what you do, don't you? I enjoy it. You enjoy it. Yeah, it's, fan it's fantastic. I love broadcast. It's fantastic. Well, we've got a, a VT uh, videotape. Um, there's me using the industry jargon uh, coming up in a minute, which is a bit of a showreel of some of the stuff you've done here. Thank you. Uh, so that we can swap you out and, and get uh, Dr. White in. Uh, but one last comment, golden rule. If there's one thing you should not do in broadcast PR, what would, what would it be? When you see it, you go, oh, I can't believe they've done that. You shouldn't do that. Overbrand. Overbrand. Okay. Forget, forget plug, about it. Plug, 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 plug. It's just it. tune off. Hate it. Thank you very much, Howard Koski. Pleasure. Uh, much appreciated. And, and thank you for your support of uh, CIP, CIPR TV. My pleasure, Phil. So, uh, coming up, we will have Dr. John White. Uh, he's going to change on the sofa right now with Howard. Tune back here in, in three minutes. In the meantime, we're going to leave you with that show reel uh, so that you can get to grips with what marketers for DC have been achieving. And this is not a plug, they've not asked me to do that, but I think it's a great VT. See you back here in three minutes. So you pop that in a bowl. Now this it's a sort of key ingredient. McDonald's customers will be able to see how many calories there are in their burgers, salads or Happy Meals. It's a big deal, right? So do not adjust your screens, your iPads, your phones. You look like you're having the time of your life. That's a random fact Everybody wants everything immediately nowadays. I think everyone starts to believe in themselves more now on the pitch as well, so hopefully we can continue that. But I believe there are some things that we can do to help. People need to learn that they have to participate in the creation of their own pension. They need to monitor them and be aware of the value of those pensions. Airbus has already revolutionised flying, but how will we experience air travel in the future? BT have got uh, 100 people from around the UK who are putting all their Olympics experiences on the website. Last year, nearly 4,000 people ended up in hospital at while away. Here it is, an Opal, that's the Open Air Laboratory, if you can see it. Max Beasley is going to join us from LA. His dad, who's here with us now, lives with the disease. It's exciting to be a part of it at the same time. Hello and welcome to Studio Talk, coming to you live from New York City. I'm joined by two of the key figures driving the UN's response to the planet's loss of biodiversity. Great to see you today. You're a single dad, so you've made time to come and spend time with us. Dragged yourself away from your children. You've got two boys. Hello, Carfo fans. I'm Eliza Doolittle. Welcome to the launch of the new Ink Cloud Touch Phone. Um, we're going to play a few songs for you. Hello and welcome to Mum's Half Hour. I'm Tamsin Alfwait. Really divert all your energy into it. Really just push everything. <laughs> oh. Be safe out there. Until next time, take it easy. Hi and welcome back to part two of the final CIPR TV show of 2011. Now between July and October this year, 
Dr. John White, a man with a distinguished career as a consultant, researcher and educator in the field of public relations, conducted 15 focus groups at various locations across the UK. The aim of the research was to find out what CIPR members believe would be the factors or variables at work in a successful, thriving public relations practice in 2020. Wow, so that's some future gazing. Uh, the outcome is an in-depth series of recommendations for the profession and the CIPR, and the findings were launched and discussed last night in Russell Square in London, along with the annual State of the Profession survey. Joining me now to discuss the research is John himself. Thanks very much for joining us. No, it's a pleasure. How did you find the experience of going around the country and conducting these uh, 15 sessions? It was a tremendous experience, really. To, uh, there are some parts of the country that I hadn't, um, hadn't visited before, like, um, like um, Aberdeen. I hadn't spent much time in Aberdeen before. And so to spend time in Scotland and to um, see the country in the course of a few months was really quite um, a privilege. And did you find that the things you were being told, that the, the, the themes that were emerging were consistent from the start, or did you realise that maybe it yes, was more so diverse? it was actually very surprising to hear okay. the same themes coming through very early on. So walk so us through uh, exactly how you conducted each of the sessions. Well, I was using the approach of scenario planning. Right. So it's a way of uh, guiding a discussion about the future. If you just talk about the future and speculate about the future, you can have fun in the discussion, but it's not so productive as if you keep to a discipline and look at possible scenarios for the future and you develop those out of a disciplined discussion of most likely developments, mm. best developments and worst developments against factors or variables that would be part of a successful future for an organisation like the Chartered Institute of Public Relations. So now, don't forget that at any point you can submit a question to John with hash CIPR TV on Twitter or on the web form. Of course, we're not just talking about the future of the PR profession, we're talking about your future as a professional practicing public relations. So, is it good news or bad news? Uh, it can be very good news, actually. <laughs> Uh, the prospects for the practice could be very bright. That's taking the best set of best case scenarios that we came up with. It could be much less bright, and it's up to us actually as to what we do to realize a better future for the practice. And that comes out very clearly in the whole set of discussions. Bit of a heated debate last night. Well, last night when we met at uh, CIPR and I uh, gave a presentation on the um, findings of the study, we did have quite a heated debate before what I was presenting and what comrades were presenting. And there really are some significant issues in the practice that really need to be addressed. You're well aware of the current debate going on on definitions. Mm -hmm. And then the events of this week really have raised questions again about codes of conduct and the need to develop those. There are initiatives taking place to look at how people come into the practice, the sort of education they they can look to before they come into the practice, when they come into the practice, the sort of training and professional development that's available to them after they come into the practice. There's no shortage of issues for us to um, talk about. Do you ever wonder, I think back to some of the disagreements, heated discussions that I've had personally in the past, sometimes it turns out after a few hours that you were disagreeing because you were talking about different things. Was there yes, well, that's very true, especially when it comes to public relations, mm -hmm. because there are at least four major conceptions of public relations current at the time, at, at the moment, and um, you know these need to be addressed because it's very, you know, the uh, effort to define public relations is trying to compress what we do into PRSA's attempt to define public relations. Talked of the practice in about four short categories. You know, what does public relations do, who for, for what? Yes, it's, and it's not that simple. It's quite a restrictive format, but uh, Keith Trivet at the PRSA has said they're trying to find a definition that would slot neatly into a dictionary and realise that there might be a, a piece of work that goes alongside that definition. Well, definitely. That's, and that came very strongly out of the uh, discussions around the country. One of the main findings of the study was that we need to be much clearer about what public relations is and what it can achieve. I mean, if we can't talk clearly about it among ourselves, how on earth can we go to clients or try to explain ourselves when questions are raised about the practice as they have been this week? John, what is public relations? 
What is public relations? Well, it depends which definition you want to. Uh, I'm and we all you. have our I'm asking you. <laughs> Look, my, my definition of public relations is, and it's really going back to the work of some of the founding fathers of the practice in the US, public relations is an applied psychology. What we're interested in in public relations is trying to influence behavior. So a consultant with a client will say, employ me and I hope that I'll be able to influence groups that are important to you in some way that will be helpful to you. That's a psychological exercise. It's setting up a suggestion that you can do something to influence behavior, that you have some understanding of behavior, yeah, yeah. and that you have access to a number of techniques which will help you try to influence the behavior that you're setting out to change. Well, you'll, so, you'll know that we're going to be in violent agreement on, on that one. Although I, I guess we I would haven't also had the full discussion. We, yet, we haven't, uh, no. But equally, you, would you include the ability to make sure you're influenced back? Yes. To be the proxy of the stakeholders within the organisation. Because well. that's the bit that we don't see so much it's of. It's also I think. understanding your own behaviour mm. and how your own behaviour will affect the behaviour that you're trying to change in others. That if you run up against something where it's not really going to be possible to change their behaviour, unless you change something about your own behavior, you've got to be willing to look at yourself at the same time. So my definition of public relations is that it's an applied psychology which looks at uh, problems or opportunities in relationships where what you're trying to do is set out to change the behavior of groups, individuals and groups in those relationships, recognizing at the same time that you may have to change your own behavior as part of the whole exercise. So public relations is an applied psychology. If you, if you wanted to try to get into some sort of tedious definition, it's an applied psychology of intra and intergroup relations, where you apply the psychology involved in public relations to attempts to influence or change behavior. You know, everything else is elaboration of that. So we will get onto the recommendations after just this first question, which is, What's the genesis for this piece of work? The genesis for the piece of work, when CIPR gained its charter, there's a commitment associated with the charter to carry out research into the practice, to uh, use research to develop the practice. We're now at a point where we've got to act on that um, commitment. So in the last few uh, months, uh, most of this year in fact, we've been working to set up a research and development unit within the Institute. This is a loose network of a number of individuals who are working together to look at putting a research foundation under public relations practice. A lot of work has been done on this already. It's a matter partly of drawing material together. But we thought as a first exercise we'd find out from practitioners in the country how important they regard uh, research into the practice as being. Mm -hmm. So the idea was to have a series of discussions with practitioners around the country about the future of the practice, to try to draw out from that a sense of what the requirement for research would be. But in the course of the discussions, we also felt that we would learn a lot about the issues on practitioners' minds, and the results of the discussions would also feed back into CIPR's policy making an agenda for action for the Institute going forward. And I think if you have a chance to read the whole report, you'll see that there's a tremendous amount of information in there that will give guidance to the Institute for action going forward. So that, that, that was the origin of the, the research. And what, and what have you found? Well, I don't know where to begin, really. You know it's a 97-page uh, report. Let me take well, you quickly we'll through. with an executive summary for those yes, who don't quite fancy exactly. the 96 I did pages. I say last night that, you know, for those with the patience, they're very welcome to read through all the discussions that we had and draw conclusions mm -hmm. for themselves as to what was said. But uh, the clear findings of the um, study are that um, there's a need for leadership of the practice which feeds directly into CIPR's interests because it is one of the bodies in the UK that is in a position to provide that leadership. 
there's a need to look again at education and training for public relations mm -hmm. practice. So there's a need to work for much stronger collaboration with educational institutions offering uh, programs of preparation for public relations. There's a need to look again at training. There's a need for practitioners to become much more confident about what they're doing. That uh, they need to make a commitment to continuing professional development. They need to be confident that they can draw on the resources of the institute to do that. They also have to be prepared to act as role models through performance to demonstrate what public relations practice is really about. And this is where you get into the problems of definition because practitioners as a group will say that there is a need for this clarity of definition. Mm -hmm. So that was actually one of the surprising findings of the study, that there is still uncertainty among the practitioner group, members of CIPR, as to what public relations well, I guess is. It's still so. a nascent profession. I, I mean, I, I'm, I'm a chartered engineer. Engineering goes back centuries, not just decades, and the way in which you conduct yourself as a professional engineer is extremely well understood. The engagement between academia and research and practitioners is extremely open and rigorous. Maybe we're, yeah, maybe we're just maybe we're just public relations profession is just still finding its way. We, maybe we shouldn't be definitely so hasty. Uh, we said we said in some of the material we've released on the study that public relations is a rapidly evolving practice, and that's very true. You know, we are still at a very early stage of professional development. And there are some of us who will say that we never will be a profession like the engineers, like lawyers, like doctors, but we can still be highly professional in our approach to practice. And the reason why I say we can't be a profession like those is that our body of knowledge is by no means as clear. It's much more wide-ranging. So it's hard to say there is a defined and complete body of knowledge that people have to have before they can practice. Barriers to entry. The established professions have clear barriers to entry. You have to take courses of study, you have to meet entry requirements. Continuous professional development, and interview so panels. Yeah, so I, I appreciate we, that, you know, definitely. There are a number of defined so Should we have a license to operate? I know that was a question that came up last no, night. No, because uh, that would be too restrictive. So in just the having the chartered the status have to do, is sufficient chartered to differentiate someone who's very least, important. Very, okay. very important but it's a basis for now for future development. It's not an end in itself, it's a basis for future Do you see a schism amongst those that currently call themselves PR practitioners? Do you think that by 2020, some of the people who are called PR practitioners now will be doing something quite different from what other that PR practitioners have labeled some today? Of the discussions of worst case scenarios, mm -hmm. the fear was that by 2020, practitioners would be irrelevant. The sort of skills they can offer now will be irrelevant by 2020. And I mean, this is echoed by other work that's going on at the moment. I mean, I mentioned last night there's an, an excellent new book by Kevin Murray called The Language of Leaders. And from the uh, snippets from that book released, he made one point about transparency means that corporate communications practice, as it's currently um, practiced, is unfit for purpose. Mm -hmm. You know, the, the mm -hmm. techniques that we have used up to this point, really all of them, and the previous segment of this program made that clear about broadcast, all the techniques that we've used up to this point have to be re-examined. Yeah, and we have to ensure our mastery of old techniques, definitely, but we've also got to learn very quickly to master the new techniques. Is it, I mean, it's a case, uh, an axiom of the 20th century, was that perception is reality. And you could argue now with the radical transparency lent by social media, that reality is now perception, it's switched on its head. And actually you can't, if you want to be considered to have a great reputation, if you want to be a great organization, there's only one way to do that now, and that's to be a great organization absolutely. and have the communications no, in place, I mean, to have that mutual understanding around everyone so that you can maintain that status yeah, as well. Previous work that I've done with CEOs um, about five years ago, well, that was one of the things that one of the CEOs said very emphatically, uh, you have to live the reputation you want to have. You have to be the organization that you want people to recognize and accord a certain kind of reputation to, which is very important for public relations practice because this takes us directly into questions of performance. This is well, we, we, we are getting some uh, traffic on Twitter. We have 
at Louise M. Carter 87, succinct Twitter handle that one, at Jack Fitzsimmons, at Dan Howe, and of course, Philip Young. So th thanks everybody for uh, tweeting in. Um, where do we go from here? What, 2020 is quite a long way away. 2012 is much sooner. What should we be doing well, next year? That's the whole purpose of scenario planning. Mm. It really is a very practical aid to decision making, planning, and setting direction, you know, developing strategy. So where do we go from here? Uh, I, think there's, I think it's true to say that there's new energy in the professional bodies, CIPR, PRCA, there's new energy, there's a, there's a desire to really drive the practice forward. And I think we've both, both the bodies that you recognize as having a role in doing that in the UK, are getting clearer about what they need to do next to drive the practice forward. The PR 2020 study will inform the CIPR's planning for direction going forward. So already uh, CIPR has responded to some of the concerns raised by members around the country by changing the membership criterion. Mm -hmm. So they're clearer. So it will become clearer in the new year as to how you actually make progress in a career in public relations. There'll be a need to look again at education and training, uh, professional development, not an option a requirement. You can't practice public relations without being involved in continuous professional development because of the pace of change. Yes. yes. You, if you don't keep up, you'll be obsolete very quickly. So one, one argument in the, in the study is against um, failure to embrace change. The, there really isn't any room for self-satisfaction, we know it all or complacency. What, what do we need to know? We've been in practice for 30, 40 years. What do we need to know? Everybody is involved in continuous professional development and, and need to take that on board. But, uh, so the report is up live now on, on the CIPR website for yes, everybody to take a look at. All 97 and pages. Should they email you personally with any feedback? Very, very welcome to get in touch with me personally. I uh, will try to respond. I, I don't know how much uh, feedback I will get. But and of course with the CIPR team. And do you think you yes. might re revisit the research in, in some time to Definitely come to, it'll be to an see if we're, to how things one are of, One of the recommendations coming out of the study was that it should be repeated uh, at some time in the future. Well, I hope you'll come back and join us again to... Well, to give us happy, an update at that point. To do that. John, uh, thank you so much for coming in and, and no, talking yeah. through PR 2020. Very welcome. Thank you. For so it's time to bring the show to a close. It's been a fascinating discussion. Uh, I'd like to thank our guests, Howard and John, and thank you also for watching, and to the production team here, of course, at Marketers for DC. Before we close the show, we wanted to let you know that all the past CIPR TV shows are now available on iTunes, and you can subscribe to our feed there by going to your iTunes store and searching simply for CIPR TV. This is the last CIPR TV show of 2011. We hope you've enjoyed the show this year. And just time for one last plug. Don't forget to book your place for the CIPR's first major event of 2012, the Maggie Nally, the Maggie Nally Memorial Lecture on 19th of January 2012 at the Palace of Westminster with Richard Gisbert of Al Jazeera listening post on media coverage, coverage of the Arab Spring. For that, for news of the first CIPR TV of the new year and the best PR content on the web, make sure you log on to the CIPR website cipr.co.uk. Until then, have a very Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year. Thank you.